basic argument of poetic heroes is that heroic poetry captures and expresses various ideas, values, attitudes, even social codes that have to do with warriors, both in ancient Israel itself, and we see this in the Bible, in a number of poems, but also in a number of um, literary texts outside of the Bible from a corpus of literature called the Ugaritic Texts. So heroic poetry, mostly in the Hebrew Bible, is early poetry, and it's suggestive of an early Israelite situation where warfare itself plays an extremely important role in what we might call the literary profile of Israel's earliest literature. One of the things that happens as we move through the Bible is that this kind of poetry seems to die out. Why does it end with David? Why are there no more heroic poems after David in these books? Certainly there's plenty of warfare, there are plenty of Israelite victories, plenty of Israelite defeats, but there is no heroic poetry. And there's, this raises a question. Is heroic poetry diminishing in the culture? I mean, there could be literary reasons why, but my suspicion is that heroic poetry diminishes with the rise of the monarchy in ancient Israel. That heroic poetry seems, at least for ancient Israel, maybe not for every place else, but at least within ancient Israel, seems most at home among the tribal militias. And warrior poetry celebrates its victories, it focuses on warrior individuals, and it seems very much classically at home in this setting. And it seems to me that what may be going on, and I qualify that with that may be going on, is warrior poetry is being displaced in the culture because the culture itself is going through a rather substantial change. Heroic poetry is a cross-cultural phenomenon that we see not only in the Hebrew Bible, we also see it in Mesopotamia to the east, and we see it in, of course, classical tradition to the west. The most dramatic example uh, from Greece, of course, is the Iliad. And the Iliad it itself is, we might say, a warrior poem or a heroic poem. It actually names Achilles himself, and not simply Achilles himself, but the wrath of Achilles. And this wrath of Achilles captures what is considered to be a real ideal within warfare. When you're actually at war or in war, this intensity, this fury, is a prized virtue of warrior culture. So we have considerable archaeological evidence that pertains to swords and what we might call other tools of war. We have these arrowheads that come from the area of ancient Israel, and rather interestingly enough, they are inscribed, many of them. And these include some interesting names. So on one arrowhead, someone's name is literally the son of Anat. She's known as a goddess from the Ugaritic texts. When she fights in the Baal cycle, she literally wades in the blood of warriors and she attaches the hands and heads of defeated warriors around her waist. Why do I mention Anat is because the name of Shamgar ben Anat in the book of Judges, he's the son of Anat. We also have these arrowheads, and the arrowheads name one of our figures, he's called son of Anat. And a number of scholars have hypothesized that son of Anat is a kind of warrior designation for men. I mean, they are characteristically the warriors, but interestingly named for a goddess. And not a god. And this may be, this may be because the goddess is not just the model for human warriors, but there may be a kind of an idea that the goddess is also the mentor of warriors. And they, in a sense, they take perhaps their name, a kind of fictive lineage, the son of Anat. They're not literally the son of Anat, but a kind of fictive lineage from the goddess. 
I hope that a contribution of this book is the effort to realize both the connections between this literary evidence and the broader situation in the material culture, and at the same time remembering that these poems are literary representations or commemorations, and that they are not simply windows into this past. In fact, they may, they suggest in some ways that they're very much not giving us a window into this past because there's certainly certain topics which warrior poetry does not deal with. It does not deal with, um, um, you know, massacres very much, for example. It doesn't deal, it doesn't deal um, very much. It may name rape as a topic, but it is not, it doesn't dramatize rape because the whole point is to glorify. And when you glorify, you've already made a massive selection in what you're representing. In fact, what you've done is you're making warfare alluring, attractive. You're making it pretty in a sort of sense. You are enticing your audience. And in fact, then what you've done is you've done the opposite of describing warfare straight up. The Iliad is, is, of course, a bit of an exception in this regard. But when we're looking at the material in ancient Israel, this is a kind of glorification of warfare. And it seems to me that another, I, I don't believe that this book itself would be that contribution, but certainly efforts to strip away this kind of glorification of warfare is always a salutary effort.